right, I think we're good. Yes. Hello, everyone. <laughs> good afternoon and welcome. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for this very important discussion about extreme heat, health and the impacts of climate change. Um, we are have, going to have a very big discussion and we really look forward to all your questions. The first, I'd like to start by acknowledging, as we always should, and uh, as we, as we uh, are privileged to do, that we are doing this talk on all different parts of the country and that we're all standing on Aboriginal land that was never ceded. So I'd like to pay my respects to Elders, past, present and emerging, and pay my particular respect to all First Nations people uh, who are joining us today and that we pay particular respect to your views about stewardship of this planet which you've been doing so carefully for so many centuries and so we are particularly respectful um, of that role. So we want to start this afternoon by giving you a few different perspectives on where we sit with extreme heat and health impacts and how they relate to climate change. So um, we have a we have a range of different disciplinary perspectives and different types of research to present to you, and then we really want to get a bit of discussion going. So we're going to have more of a chat. Um, think of me as Oprah, if you will. All right. So we're going to start with uh, imagine my colleagues are on the couch next to me, um, and we're going to start with Professor Brendan Mackey. I'll just introduce him. He's the director of the Griffith Climate Action Beacon at Griffith University, who is the who is auspicing this event. The beacon seeks to develop knowledge, leadership, capacity and responses to enable effective and just climate action throughout society. And it focuses specifically on interdisciplinary research and cross-sectoral practice collaborations as catalysts for climate action. I'm a proud, most, and all of us here are proud members of the beacon. He is also the coordinating lead author for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, Chapter 11, Australasia. So straight from the horse's mouth to you, uh, what's going to happen in Australia. He has a PhD in ecology from the Australian National University and has authored over 250 publications. That's crazy, Brendan. 250 publications in the fields of environmental science and policy. So welcome, Brendan, and we'll come to you very shortly. I'll just now uh, move to Jean. So Jean Polutikov is a professor in the National Climate Change Adaptation Research Facility at Griffith University Australia, where she's been since 2008. Previously, she managed production of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Fourth Assessment Report for Working Group 2, which dealt with impacts, adaptation and vulnerability while based at the UK Met Office. From 1979 to 2004, she worked at the University of East Anglia, UK, becoming a professor in the School of Environmental Science and um, Director of the Climatic Research Unit. So such a pioneer in this space, a very long perspective, and it must have been extremely difficult in many of those years, Jean. Um, her research interests focus on climate change imp impacts and adaptation and communication of knowledge to adaptation decision makers. So welcome, Jean. We're, we're very privileged That's to have cool. you here. Thank you. Uh, next, can I introduce Tony Matthews? Dr. Tony Matthews is an urban planner and an international advocate for good cities. Uh, Dr. Matthews has a passion for translating insights into understandable and actionable terms with benefits for policymakers, professionals, and communities. He's a faculty member at Griffith University and he's a, he uh, is a senior lecturer in the School of Engineering and the Built Environment and a member of the City's Research Institute. Through his advocacy, engagement, and communication, Dr. Matthews has informed policy decisions and shaped real world outcomes in cities. I've been privileged to watch him in action, uh, having that impact, and it's quite extraordinary. His award winning research on urban greenery, for example, has informed urban planning policy and design in Australia and beyond. Uh, so we have that city's perspective, urban planning perspective, and now we move to our health expert, Associate Professor Shannon Rutherford. She has a background in environmental science and Shannon's career has focused on researching the links between environmental change and human health and building capacity to understand and respond at local, national and global levels. She currently leads the Climate and Health Collective, a Griffith group of multidisciplinary researchers committed to collaboration to solve climate and health problems. 
She is committed to leading transdisciplinary research that improves the health of communities, focusing on climate and health impact and risk management research. She's currently involved in numerous health and heat and health research projects, which are particularly focused on uh, heat vulnerable populations, especially older people and children. And I should say my name is Susan Harris Rimmer. I probably should have said that at the beginning. <laughs> uh, I'm the director of the Policy Innovation Hub at Griffith University, and I'm very privileged to lead the climate justice theme of the Beacon. Uh, I'm a human rights lawyer, and I'm interested in that intersection between human rights and climate impact. So let's start with the nitty gritty. Brendan, um, could you please tell us about what the heat projections look like from the IPCC for Australia? So, Susan, can I just have you confirm that you can see my PowerPoint? Okay. I certainly can. We just need the we need the live thing to switch to Brendan though, don't we? How do we do that? There we go. Got it. <laughs> okay. So you can see my you can see my slides, okay? Yes. Okay. Well, um, again, let also I should say, let me begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I'm talking to you from, uh, on the Gold Coast, which is the land of the Yungar Bay and Commonberry peoples, and I. I like to show this map because it reminds us of wherever we go in Australia, we're on somebody's land that we need to be acknowledging. And I, of course, pay my respects to elders past, present and future and other countrymen and women listening today. Actually, Susan, I thought rather than just focusing in on Australia, because we've got others talking on the panel who can speak to that, um, uh, what I want to do is just take a step back and give you the global perspective on what the IPCC said about climate change and extreme heat events, because that really sets the scene for what we're talking about in terms of what Australia needs to be dealing with. And I'm going to be, what I'm presenting with you is, is from the most recent IPCC reports. There's actually three reports for each each assessment, the assessments come out every seven years. Uh, they assess all the peer reviewed and authoritative reports that are published in the preceding period. So they're a synthesis of what we know, what research has found up to a given point in time and translate that into that science into, into policy relevant conclusions and recommendations. There are three working groups for each report. So what I'm talking about today comes from working group one, the physical science basis of climate change, and also some of the findings from working group two that I was a coordinating lead author for climate change impacts, i.e. what impact from a changing climate are we observing on our human and natural systems and what's projected for the future and what are our adaptation options for for moderating some of those impacts and, and our vulnerabilities to those impacts. Let me just by way of kind of context, because we talk about degrees of global, war global warming all the time. You would have heard this, you know, talking about the governments have agreed to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. The thing to keep in mind is, you know, it's an index and I like to draw an analogy of it you know, we can think of it as a thermometer reading of Earth's health. So on the left of my slide, uh, you know, we all know that a safe average body temperature for a healthy adult is around 36 to 37 degrees. 38 degrees Celsius is diagnostic of a fever and above 40 degrees is life threatening. If you're at your GP's clinic, they'd be rushing off to emergency ward in a, in an ambulance. So by analogy, the as I say on the right hand side, the average annual daily global surface temperature, um, which is what the index is when we talk about global degrees of warming, a healthy Earth temperature is actually zero. It's zero degrees above pre-industrial levels, which we fix at around around 1850, which is when the UK really and and and, and Europe and uh, uh, started to really hoe into fossil fuels and and start intensive land clearing. So a healthy Earth temperature is zero. Um, currently, we're experiencing 
one degree of global warming above pre-industrial levels. Well, I would argue that's equivalent of a planetary fever. And the reason why, as I'll explain shortly, 1.5 degrees is the agreed global warming target, because above that is equivalent of a life-threatening 40 degrees temperature for a human. So in the following slides, when I talk about global warming, keep this in mind. So this graph shows you the average, uh, it shows you the degrees of global warming at relative to pre-industrial levels starting in around 1850. And of course, it's observed global warming up to 2020. And you can see there are these colored lines going forward. And you can also see that about now around 2020 is when the different future possible scenarios start to diverge. So the blue is where we hope temperature will go by 2100. It'll sit around 1.5. Uh, the orange is where current government commitments are, and the red is um, uh, where, where we have been heading without any government policy. So the key points to keep in mind, as I said, where climate change has happened, we're currently experiencing 1.1 degree of global warming. The bad news is another 0.4 degree of global warming is locked in and likely to be reached by 2030. Right, so we will hit 1.5 degrees in, in about 10 years time. The level of mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions, the level of ambition and implementation of those policies will determine if warming is capped at 1.5 degrees or if it continues. We can do no better really than 1.5 degrees. And this is the key point, climate impacts and risks increase with every increment of global warming. So we have another 0.4 degrees of global warming locked in, and that's a very significant amount of increase indeed. So what do we mean by climate impacts and risks? Well, the key message here is that what we call ongoing climate trends uh, are exacerbating, have exacerbating extreme events. So by, by climate trends, I mean the general increase in global temperature we were talking about. And so the increase in average temperature in Australia, this slow, tenacious um, rise in sea levels. We've got trends of decreasing winter rainfall in southern Australia, increasing rainfall in northwest Australia. These are long term trends, but now we know that they are driving an increase in the frequency and severity and duration of all extreme weather events, including those experienced in Australia, heat waves, catastrophic fire weather conditions, droughts, the intensity and, and, and location of tropical cyclones and, and catastrophic flooding. That's a photo from Lismore in February. So this is one of the key findings from the sixth assessment report that when we think about climate change, we're not just talking about the impacts of trends, we're talking about having to deal with exacerbated extreme events and in Australia and everywhere in the world, this certainly means an increase in extreme heat, heat events and what we call extreme heat waves. And this is a, a projection of, um, the, again, this is another index. It's called the e event intensity of extremely high heat wave events. So what we, what we would have considered to be one in 10 year events or one in 50 year events are going to happen with increasing intensity and frequency with every increment of global warming. We know that their event intensity is going to double in the next decade because um, uh, we're going to hit 1.5 degrees in about 10 years time. And also notice that it's non-linear. So with every increment in, in global warming, we get a, a, a greater increase in the intensity of extreme heat events. So this is my last slide. Um, IPCC calls these, you know, burning ember diagrams, but they indicate the the, the risk of different uh, uh, impacts on human or natural systems. In this case, it's the risk of the increase in heat related mortality in Australia, in deaths, the, the deaths of people from, from heat waves, 
uh, with degrees of global warming. And as I said, we're at 1.1. And you see the risk categories go from moderate to very high, yellow to purple. And you can see there are two columns, low adaptation, moderate adaptation. What that is trying to give us an indication of is that, uh, well, why isn't it purple now? It isn't purple now, because when it comes to heat impacts on human mortalities, there's a lot we can do to adapt and, and moderate those impacts. Um, obviously, if people can afford it, they can have air conditioning. Uh, people can have homes that are better designed so that they, you know, they have insulation in the roof or walls, you know, ceiling fans, et cetera. Um, so there are things we can do. We can change the time of day when we work outdoors or play. So there are a lot of adaptation options for people, but you can see um, a moderate risk actually is not no risk. <laughs> a moderate risk still means there's heat related mortalities. And you can see that once we get above 1.5 degrees, we're in high to, to very high risk, and we are going to hit 1.5 degrees. And above two degrees, our adaptive capacity is exceeded. So just to conclude, here are just some high level conclusions from the IPCC. As I said, with every additional increment of global warming, changes in extremes continue to become larger. Every additional 0.5 degrees of global warming causes clearly discernible increases in the intensity and frequency of hot extremes, including heat wave events. It is virtually certain and that's about as confident as science can be, that the frequency and intensity of hot extremes and the intensity and durations of heat waves will further increase in the future, even if global warming is stabilised at 1.5 degrees. And that's because of various lags and inertia in the, in, in the systems of Earth system response. And I wanted to um, finish on these two points. Uh, cities intensify human-induced warming locally and further urbanisation together with more frequent hot extremes will increase the severity of heat waves. In fact, further urbanisation will amplify the projected air temperature change in cities, regardless of the characteristics of the background climate, resulting in a warming signal on minimum temperatures that could be as large as the global warming signal itself. This is what we call a positive feedback. Not only is our human um, influence climate change increasing extreme heat wave events, but increasing urbanisation, um, uh, if not done properly, will amplify that again. So Susan, I'll stop there. That's just an overview from a global perspective of what we're experiencing and what we can expect in the next 10 years. Always, always cheery. Uh... It's cheerful, Brendan, uh, but incredibly interesting and so well presented. It really helps us understand what we're talking about. So I'm going to come to Jean, Shannon and Tony and then back to you, Brendan, about how your research on extreme heat health and as we heard their cities in particular, uh, help us take action. And we're interested in how you ended up in this research space too, a little bit uh, about that. So we might start with you, Jean, because uh, you've been in this research space for the longest. So um, we're very just interested to hear um, about your journey and where your interest, where your interests help us take action on extreme heat and health. Uh, and sorry, I think you're on mute. Sorry, Jean. There we go. Thank you, Susan. Uh, I'll do my best. Yes, you're right. I have been working in climate change for a very long time. And in fact, my uh, PhD thesis was on urban climates and the potential to increase precipitation over urban areas, which I think is not a, anything that people focus on these days. They're much more likely to look at the heat impacts. So uh, thank you, Brendan, for that talk. It was really interesting and really good to catch up, which I haven't done so far with what the IPCC is saying about heat waves. Um, here in uh, NCAF, we are working in Australia uh, with Queensland Health in particular to look at producing risk assessment and risk management strategies for um, all aspects of climate change. So not just extreme heat, but it includes heat waves. It also looks at droughts and floods. 
and, and providing the workforce of hospitals and health services in Queensland with the skills and tools to manage those extremes. And we've been doing that with Queensland Health for about five or six years and we're beginning to get some traction, although I have to say it's extremely uh, slow work. Um, as you know, we're also working in Bangladesh to look at the effects of extreme heat on the workforce in ready-made garment factories, uh, specifically in Dakar. And it's a very different story from what you um, see and observe in uh, Queensland, but it's a very fascinating story. And I think it's a very important story because uh, it's a huge workforce in, in the Bangladesh ready-made garment factory uh, workforce. It's 4 million people and 60% of those people are women and it's quite rare I think in developing countries to see an industry that provides uh, an income, a good income and a regular income for young women of modest education. So it's really important to see how those women can cope in very severe factory conditions. We, we read about um, how the factories are unsafe but we don't really read about how heat affects them. And yet for Bangladesh, the predictions are even for SSP3 uh, 7.0, uh, that temperatures will increase by about 2.5 degrees. And frighteningly, in the urban area of Dakar, the urban heat island effect may add an extra four degrees to that. So what they're facing in Bangladesh is um, a very extreme version of what we're looking at here in Australia. So it's interesting to uh, see the contrast between what is happening in the two countries. Thank you, Susan. Thank you so much, Jean. Uh, as soon as I heard about your research, I thought about this idea of sweatshops. It says it all, doesn't it? You know, uh, sweatshops coping with climate change and, and thinking about the, just the terrible fires that happened in Bangladesh and the regulation of the garment industry. So many interesting aspects of your research, including that gender focus. Uh, so we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, I now might ask um, Tony if it, uh, Brendan made that point about cities there, and that's your that's your place. So I'd love to hear how you're working on those global ideas to to bring them into people's neighbourhoods. Yeah, thanks, Susan. Um, and I'm happy to speak on that, and great to be part of the panel. Um, I suppose. Like everybody, I started out somewhere um, with all of this and it wasn't necessarily in the heat space. I, I started out about 12 or 13 years ago um, just in the more sort of broad based climate change adaptation as uh, a consideration for urban planning and just for cities more generally. Um, and it seems like we've traveled a long way in that time and indeed we have. So 12 years ago, we were much less uh, sophisticated in terms of, of making judgments on, on where um, climate change, change impacts were landing or might land and what might be done about them. So I spent a lot of time working on things like green infrastructure and urban greenery, which I'm still working intensely on. I spent a lot of time working around policy change and institutional change to take on climate change adaptation as another uh, obligation, as another challenge to be overcome. And, and, and throughout that journey over time, I began to really focus in on, on this idea of, well, there's, there's climate change and then there's climate change impacts and climate change impacts are are something very specific and and yes cities are in many ways potentially exacerbating climate change they're also the one of the key landing points for climate change impacts and so i've been working in australia for a long time and it became more and more evident over time that the the big impact that we were seeing so far was was it was an uptick in, an uptake in heat and heat stress and illnesses related to heat and other implications for cities which are not just illness i mean efficiency goes way down as well um and, and things like domestic violence tend to go up so there are many many social impacts of heat as well as the environmental and, and, and economic ones and so it became evident to me that um heat was becoming a very big problem in many australian cities and then within that um question, uh, I started to think, well, who specifically is most vulnerable uh, based on where they are and how they're moving and what they're doing. And so it became very obvious to me fairly quickly that um, two of the key cohorts in any city, in any society that are vulnerable to heat stress are young people, uh, that is particularly primary school children or indeed high school age children, but specifically primary school age children sitting in schools all day. And then also older people 
uh, who are retired or less active and who may be living in supported accommodation or um, particularly aged care, which is somewhere that I spent a lot of time looking. So it, it became apparent to me over the years that if climate change was producing a significant volume of heat and that was distributing onto Australian cities, then older people and younger people were, were feeling that far more. And the fact that they spent a lot of their time in specific locations for long periods meant that they were very vulnerable environmentally to heat stress. And so a lot of my work for the last couple of years, um, both with Shannon Rutherford, who we're going to hear from next, and others uh, inside and outside Griffith, has really focused on addressing um, uh, the environmental quality of of some of these areas, aged care facilities and schools particularly, where heat load is high um, and figuring out well, what can be done about that to trigger a whole slew of improvements. And so we, we do find that when we try and manage and remediate heat in specific areas and locations, uh, it's very possible to, to also trigger a, a whole series of co-benefits or multiple benefits from the work too. So that's been really exciting. So it's kind of funneled from a, a rather wide lens into a much more focused lens on, on heat over that 12 years or so. So that's that's how I've ended up in this space. And yeah, it's it's great so far. It's been really very interesting research. Thank you so much, Tony. I love that you always train your eye towards the most vulnerable members of the population in your research. And that's that's what makes it very special, I think. Um, coming to Shannon, and just before we start, Shannon, I just want Brendan to note there's a question in the chat, chat for you to start thinking about, which is about the lag between temperature rise and its effects on population. And there's going to be a question for you, Tony, about let's and for Shannon too about how do we think about uh, aging population in rural and regional areas. And then there's also a question about the Green Lab program in Nathan um, and room temperature settings in Griffith. So uh, a general idea, it's probably one for you, Shannon, about room temperature and health, um, an ideal room temperature and health. Uh, so now I'm gonna pass over to you, Shannon. Tell us about your research. Thanks, Sue. Um, probably like everyone else, I share a story of coming to this kind of heat space um, along a bit of a windy path. Um, I guess as an environmental science scientist by um, base training, um, I became interested in the impacts on human health via my interest in air quality in general. And I do recall even teaching in the 1990s and we'd have three sessions on um, you know, local air pollutants and one session on global air pollutant challenges. And so we started you know, talking about climate change a long time ago. Um, and the, the link between air quality and public health um, sort of got me interested in this notion of um, how our environmental systems, what multiple environmental systems can impact on um, our health. Um, and that kind of led me to thinking about climate change and the climate systems and how they impact on health. And I think that's kind of um, taken me to where I am right now um, via research um, and also working in government. So um, was part of Queensland Health in the environmental health area where we we were the our health team were um, charged with trying to develop an adaptation plan in the very early on when this was starting to become a bit more um, of a policy um, imperative. So um, the Climate Action Beacon really got me thinking about what actions we could be taking, particularly in the climate and health space. And um, the point that Brendan made is really important is that a lot of the heat related illness we see is preventable. If we had the right strategies in place, um, if we were to think about the things that Tony's been saying and Jean's been talking about from a workplace perspective, from where we live and work and play, um, there are certainly a lot of things that we can be doing. And I think that's the challenge now that we are all facing. So. The project that I'm mainly working on is relating to um, developing an early warning system, which has got sort of an understanding in a broader population sense, but we've kind of taken that theory into the household level, acknowledging that while we've got all these figures about ambient temperature, what people actually are exposed to in those places where they work and play might be quite different and dependent on a whole heap of factors. And we're focusing on older people. Um, because of their um, biological vulnerability, because of their um, potential health comorbidities, which make them more vulnerable, because of their potential social isolation and lack of connectedness that can also in increase their vulnerability, um, and because of some of their behaviours and the, um, the ways in which they're interacting in their built environment, which might make them less able or um, 
less um, or have less capacity to cool. Um, so we want to try to develop a digital solution, which won't be a solution that um, meets the needs of everyone, but a way of trying to build something that helps people stay at home healthier and in a safer environment as we contribute, as we um, work towards ageing in place as a policy sort of um, platform. Thank you. That's that's fascinating, and it seems so logical as a solution as well as so practical. And you know, we're used to thinking about fall alerts for mm -hmm. uh, elderly yep. people, and this is a, a very similar logic. Um, so uh, I should just explain. I, I'm, as I said, I'm a human rights lawyer. I spent most of my career not at, in academia, but in the uh, world of aid development work and humanitarian work. I used to work for the uh, UN High Commission for Refugees. And uh, I suppose I'm very interested in what happens to vulnerable people, uh, I guess, uh, in, a, in a range of situations. Climate, uh, human rights was very late to the climate change party, as uh, still is, um, and the other way around as well. So we were mainly focused on the injustices between countries in relation to, to climate mitigation. Uh, but now there's much more attention being paid to adaptation challenges inside countries. Uh, and I suppose for me, if you take a human rights approach, the, the greatest risk to people in terms of the right to life is extreme heat uh, of, of many of the various impacts. That is the one, uh, if you take a human rights risk analysis where, where you stop, and it also gives you that demographic lens of vulnerability for the rights of the elder people, where there will be a new convention soon, the rights of the child, the rights of women are particularly interested in sexual and reproductive health during uh, and those impacts and climate change. I'm interested in what happens to pregnant women in heat waves. We're seeing some horrifying stuff come out of India and Pakistan and their recent heat waves. Uh, and, uh, and I'm interested in all those kinds of social policies. So should you be able to evict someone during a heat wave? Should you be able to cut off their utilities? Uh, what should happen to homeless people during a heat wave? Uh, all those types of social policy issues. Uh, and I feel like we better start planning um, much more rigorously. So Brendan, um, I might come to you for that last bit about, we know a bit about your research, but what, what do you, in terms of your research, what's your perspective on these uh, extreme heat and health issues? Yep, yep. Um, oh yes, here he is. Um, yeah, I mean, Shannon, uh, I think, covered it in, in terms of, and, and that's what I was trying to show by that burning embers diagram, is that, you know, fortunately, when it comes to, you know, mortality and and impacts on people, there's, a, you know, an enormous uh, amount we can do, but particularly when people are living, you know, where people live and work in terms of working indoors. Um, and a lot of that, you know, again, that's, also ties in with what Tony's talking about because we can design cities and human settlements so that they're cooler overall and then we can design buildings etc um, and and have them functioning so that they're so that they're cooler and can not you know can reflect and dissipate heat better uh, etc I mean you know one of the challenges we face is if we give everyone an air conditioner and the air conditions are and electricity comes from coal-fired power stations, we make the problem worse. So, you know, it's um, there's some interesting challenges there. Someone noted in the Q&A about, about regional and rural Australia, and this is a huge issue because there are many liners of work which are outdoor work. And, you know, we, we have to start probably thinking about some ways to reduce people's exposure to heat waves who work outdoors by by changing the hour, maybe working at night outdoors under under floodlight. I mean, there's all sorts of options we we have to consider. So this brings us back to you know there's the there's the um, there's the hazard, the climate hazard, which is heat waves, stream heat events, and then there's the exposure of the person to it, how exposed they are to it, and then their their sensitivities, whether whether they're vulnerable because of their age or pre-existing medical or health condition and and their adaptive capacity. What resources do they have to 
insulate their house or cool their house or live somewhere else or, or not work outdoors. So, yeah, it ends up being a, a complex calculation, if you like. There's many different dimensions that we can need, you know, need, need to look at. But, you know, the good news is that there is a lot we can do um, by, by way of adaptation and by way of adaptation interventions. It's interesting, I'll just quickly also add, you know, uh, there was a very interesting uh, Australian produced and, and written um, uh, uh, TV series which came out a couple of years ago called The Commons. It was set in Australia in the 2030s in a climate changed world. And one of the events that happened was a mega heat wave uh, and uh, the government um, uh, had an emergency declaration which made every uh, every city office block and apartment block in the city open its foyer to everyone who, so they could come and take sanctuary in a in an air conditioned building. But it was you know 50 plus degrees outside for weeks on end, so people took over the buildings and it created all this social chaos. So uh, I actually thought that's actually quite a realistic scenario. Right? Yeah. You know, if if that's where we end up, we're going to be seeing these policies, which are quite. I mean, it it will be quite disruptive. It will be disruptive to people who have to work outdoors. It will be disruptive to farm workers, and and if our cities, if we're not doing things right in the cities, it will be highly disruptive to urban urban dwellers as well. Absolutely, I, I already saw it in America this last summer. Um, they were opening up public libraries. As, as cool havens they're called and in the yeah. UK they're opening up all the museums as heat havens, warm havens uh, during their winter because they have all the issues with energy because of Ukraine. So there's this idea that if you rely on shops or places of commerce for air conditioning cinemas, or to many Australians we rely on the local shopping centre or cinema right. or things like that, they require money and they requ they have the ability to discriminate about who's allowed in those places. It's already at such an issue for the homeless population already. So we know those discrimination issues are going to be very intense. So that idea of where will where will the public access, what is the role of the state in providing protection yeah. for people? Um, should they provide extra payments if you can't work? What about prisoner labour? What about um, what about all that informal sector? So the people who were dying in America was these um, bicycle couriers just dropping dead in the heat. It was just horrible every day in the paper. Um, so you know these issues are happening right now. There was also a big scandal about if you see a child locked in a car on a on a day over a hundred degrees in America, should you smash the windows? That was being that was the live discussion on every radio show. It was very interesting ethical issues as well about how we protect people. What we don't have at the moment is good communication to the public. So what I hear from Queensland is as often we're tough and we're used to extremes and we'll be fine. Um, so I think this kind of real acknowledgement that things are getting, things will be different and things will be harder. Um, and we're already starting to see folk from Western Queensland, for example, just leaving. So seasonal mobility a little bit more around January. So, you know, there's a lot of things to discover, but we, we've got to be a bit more nimble, I think, in our research to keep ahead of how these impacts are hitting people uh, in, in real time sort of thing. So uh, before we, we've got um, 20 minutes left, which is what we have for Q&A. Um, and at, after the end of the q and I'm going to give everyone their last word for our panel to say, what are you seeing that makes you hopeful? So, um, so think about that, but just at the moment, let's go to some of the questions. So there was a science question for Jean and Brendan about uh, the lag between issues, uh, the lag between temperature rises and the effect on the population. Did you want to speak to that, Jean or Brendan or both? Sorry about the lag. It says, um, is there a how long is the lag between temperature rise and the effects? Yeah, well, I, I did put an answer in the chat. Oh, box, yes. Which, yes. which I mean, from a global perspective, where where like we 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 um, started putting significant greenhouse gases into the atmosphere in about you know the 1850s with the start of the industrial revolution and the use of coal in the UK, and and it grew from there. 
and, and deforestation really picked up then as well. But uh, if you look back through all the uh, kind of what the IPCC has reviewed, it, it actually took quite a while before it, before we saw a really significant shift in in, in temperatures. And um, and it probably wasn't until the 70s when the signal started to come clear about we started to get an increase in extremes. And it's probably only been about the last 20 years where there's been a really clear signal of how climate trends are driving extremes. But that last graph I showed, I kind of mentioned it was nonlinear, and kind of that's what we're seeing. It took took a hundred years to get enough, you know, warming built up. The thing to the thing to keep in mind is that about eight ninety percent, I think it is, of the extra heat um, from 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 greenhouse gas gases goes into heating the ocean, not the land, right? So, and and that energy is redistributed by ocean currents and readmitted back into the atmosphere. That's one reason why there's a lag. There's a lot of energy built up in the Earth system, but most of it gets in the ocean and then it kind of gets um, um, uh, discharged uh, over time. So um, it's kind of incredible how much land temperatures have increased given that most of the extra energy is actually going into the oceans. But, so it took uh, anyway, Jean might want to add. Well, I think there's just a slightly different answer. So, so uh, to this question, which is uh, that, what is the lag between when a heat wave occurs and when people start arriving in hospitals? Oh, sorry. And the answer no, this... to that one is three days. So the hospitals are <laughs> alert when a heat wave persists for three days. They expect the ambulance call outs to go up and more people to arrive in emergency with heat stress and, and heat related complaints. So there are two answers to the question. Brendan gave one, I gave the other. <laughs> Very comprehensive. And and Shannon, did you want to just talk about there's those immediate impacts from being exposed to heat, but there's all sorts of other things that happen, isn't there, in terms of um, exacerbating people's particular illnesses? Um, so just if you could give us a little bit more detail on how extreme heat affects the human body, that would be great. Oh, sorry, and you're on mute, sorry. So um, I guess just one thing to remember is that temperature does not equal heat um, and that heat is a function of a number of things and we store heat and we can take on heat and the amount we take on depends on, depends on the ambient temperature and how much radia radia radiation type of heat we have and how much how we reduce heat in our body and how we lose heat is dependent on humidity and the ability and velocity of the air to take away um, the sweat and, and cool us down. So I think the thing to remember is just because it's cooler or hotter outside, how the body um, processes heat is kind of, it's not a linear thing. Um, and that's why older people, their, um, their ability to cool themselves is a lot um, lower because as they um, age, our sweat, the amount of sweating reduces um, and that therefore um, reduces the ability to cool. So that um, cooling, evaporative cooling effect. Um, other things also happen in the body that reduce um, older people's ability to cope. So um, their vascular system changes, so the heart cannot get the um, blood around to the surface of the, the, if you think about flushing and being red in the face, that's that ability for the exchange um, of heat from the skin to the environment. So, um, and that can't happen as well when your circuitry system is not working as effectively, which is just a, a process of aging, but is also linked to other um, preconditions. So um, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, um, and other things. Medication also can have an impact on those systems. Um, and so uh, having a bit of an understanding of what those vulnerabilities are can help us understand a bit more about what our individual risks might be um, as a separate thing to what the outdoor environment or the indoor environment might be actually measuring on a thermometer, for example. So um, certainly that in nuanced thinking um, is difficult though to do it large scale. So the current early warning systems talk about it's hot today, the Bureau of Meteorology projects it's going to be 40 degrees, um, but how is someone living in a very hot environment in a closed up house 
possibly not drinking very much water, who's already got underlying conditions, what is their heat really? So I think that's kind of the things that I'm um, learning more about as I talk to colleagues and that's why research across disciplines is incredibly valuable. So we're learning about each other's worlds in order to sell research um, disciplines in order to solve some of these problems. I, I think I was shocked about how fast it can affect people as well. It can be very, very quick. Um, I think people need to understand how fast it might uh, happen to them uh, and particularly the role of humidity. That was something I was mm -hmm. I was really picking up the way the weather was reported in Florida, for example, was, was constantly telling people about humidity levels and how long that, that meant they were safe outside at different ages. We don't report the weather like that, but clearly there's a reason Florida reports the weather like that. So yeah, I was just thinking the types of public information people need might need to change as well, exactly as you're saying, and you also need to know a lot more about yourself but also, what does it mean for poor athletes and people trying to do particular things? A lot of, a lot of the discussion is, you know, have we seen the end of summer sports and outdoor sports in summer um, already? They've completely changed a lot of the sport seasons up in northern Queensland because they just can't do them safely even now. Uh, so there, there is a lot of things to think about. So, so Tony, I wanted to ask you about in the in the chat when we're talking about rural and, and regional people too. Um, that's that's very true. And as long as a lot of larger rural or regional towns are better designed than cities <laughs> necessarily. But tell us, I mean, specifically about what types of design we should have done to to create, to avoid these kind of urban heat sinks. And, you know, they, they tend to co correspond with lower socioeconomic um, uh, indicators as well. So tell us a bit more about that inequity issue in design. Yeah, that's um, <clears throat> unfortunately very true. And just another word on the regions in terms of heat vulnerability there, the regions tend to have much higher levels of people with disabilities than the metro regions or the metro areas do. So um, you might have somewhere like 12 or 15% of people in an average regional town identifying as having a disability, uh, and it might be more like six or 8% in the city. So there's, that's another cohort that's very vulnerable in the regions beyond older people as well that we're not necessarily actively thinking about. Um, Lisa Stafford, who's a, a disability scholar, looks a lot at regional Australia and local government planning around disability services, not looking at heat, but maybe should be. Um, but I would say that to your larger question, Sue, um, the, one of the biggest things that we're doing dead wrong at the moment is the small lot housing thing. Um, where we're building houses out on the urban fringe, we're clearing land, we're building small lot housing on tiny land slices, 350, 400 square meters. Um, we're sacrificing anything that's not a structure in order to get more structures into the area. And then that ends up with that sort of classic situation that we're all a bit familiar with, which is masses of houses where the uh, eaves are bumping up against each other, if they even have eaves, or maybe just the gutters, uh, a sea of black roofs, no nature strips, no trees, no back gardens, no green spaces, and these are enormous heat sinks. Now, you might think, well, why do they exist so? And the reason that they exist and the reason that they're allowed to exist is, is, is economics. It's housing economics. They're entry level housing for a lot of people. It's where most many people make their first purchase. And so the design principle is not about increasing heat. The design principle is about reducing the, the land volume, therefore driving down the price of the property. Because when you purchase a house in Australia, 75% of what you're paying for is the land it's on, not the structure. And so the idea is reduce the land size and make housing cheaper. But on the flip side, then you're actually making heat stress much worse for those same people. And so in terms of inequality issue, what happens is you, you we're building a lot of this type of housing and a lot of first time buyers and renters are moving there. And then they have very, very little, if any, capacity to be adaptive to that heat. So they probably can't afford to put in air conditioning. If they wanted to plant a tree to shade their house, there's nowhere to put it. Um, if they want to go to a green space to try and get out of the, the, the dead heat of the house, there's nowhere to go. If you're older and you, you, you walk more slowly or you have reduced mobility for any reason, you can't go outside at all because there's no shading. And so for a lot of these people, they end up stuck with this heat problem because the only way to remediate it or to make the house itself bearable is to crank up the air conditioning and a lot of people then will choose not to do that because it's so horrifically expensive and if you're a renter you may not even have air conditioning and if you do you certainly have no option to put solar on the roof to take some of the the price pain out of it or something so there's a very significant heat equality issue 
in terms of where people are living, but particularly people at that sort of entry level or kind of lower rungs of the housing ladder. Um, and that's a really big concern. And we've been pointing that out for years. Um, and actually to Jean's point as well, um, it's local councils, local government that permit this style of housing, and then it's state governments that deal with the health impacts of the people that live there getting heat stress and ending up in hospital. So you've got one level of government passing cost and hazard onto another. Again, something I've pointed out for years, nobody seems to take that one seriously either. So yeah, that's that's definitely one place where it's happening a lot and where there's a big equality issue. And it's not intentional. It's a it's a an unintentional outcome. That makes perfect sense. And and if you think too, if you think of Brendan's ideas about cascading issues, you're looking at often places on re reclaimed land, which might have some issues, <laughs> contamination or other types of issues. It might be in a floodplain, if you think of Western Sydney and everything that's going on in Western Sydney, where they built all that dense housing on floodplains, um, it might it might be subject to coastal erosion. It might be uh, more exposed to bushfire because it's on the edge of a. You know, so it might not not only be the heat risk; it might be all these other types of uh, risks as well. And hundred you know, percent. Yeah, yeah that risk stacking can definitely occur. Um, that can definitely occur. And and then the other thing is, just as the last point, I mean, we're hearing regularly about flood flood buybacks and things like that right now. People in Lismore and even in Brisbane City itself, there's flood buybacks. Never heard of a heat buyback, but I suspect eventually we'll start hearing about them. That's fascinating. And you know, and the ability to buy a house. At, if you buy a house in Brisbane, at least you have to look at the, you, you, there is a regulatory warning. You're given the flood maps of Queensland. You have to get a mandatory report to show you what the flood risk is, but no other risk and no nothing else is, is kind of given to you. Um, I suppose and it won't come out in insurance because it's a personal risk rather than a risk to the property. So yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a really interesting area um, and something that we need to think about very hard. Um, Jean, I just wanted to ask, there's a question from Muhammad in the chat about, it was addressed to Brennan and Brennan's um, increase, but it's talking about countries that are at high risk in related to heat related illness based on research. And one of the things I've been learning is the role of humidity uh, in, in heat related illness. So, you know, the high, certain levels of humidity and heat also greatly increase risk. But I'm thinking about for Bangladesh, uh, you know, those tropical countries, they must have a more increased risk, you know, equatorial uh, countries in, in some senses, but we already know Bangladesh has very high climate risks um, generally in terms of sea level rise and, and flooding. So how what's, what's it, if you're thinking about this big picture, look at high risk in terms of heat related illnesses, and I guess we should think about pandemics as well that are created or exacerbated by climate change. What's the situation for the countries that you're researching? So I'm not entirely sure what the question is. Sorry. <laughs> oh, it was it was the question from Muhammad about are there countries in particular that are at high risk in relation to heat related illness? Uh, and um, yes. Uh, but but often those often those risks are intensified for the kind of reasons that Tony has been talking about. That's to say they're not necessarily climatic risks. They're risks which are created by the context within which the climate change takes place. So if you have uh, a very high density of a population, for example, then you find that um, the heating is exacerbated and as precisely as Tony has described, there is a limit to what people can do to manage the risks because of the environment in which they sit. So um, I think it's, um, as Brendan described, heating is greater over land areas than it is over the sea, but nevertheless, it's not necessarily what the climate is doing that makes the risks greater. It's the context within which they occur, and that context may be structural in the way that the city is designed, or it may be cultural, the way that people choose to live and prefer to live, uh, that can exacerbate those risks. I don't know, Brendan, if you want to add to that. Oh, yeah. Did you want to add something there, Shannon? Yes, please let Shannon do that. <laughs> 
Oh, sorry, you're on mute, Shannon. I'll also add it's also the um, how strong the health system is. Um, you know, if you collapse on the street in Bangladesh, the ambulance might take four hours to get through the traffic because of the poor road system to get you to a hospital, and then you might wait a very long time to be be helped. Um, so, and the access to health services and um, primary health care in some parts of cities is very low. Um, so I think it also depends on that adaptive capacity um, to actually intervene in the right places and also respond when there is illness. Thank you. And, and bef uh, before you add to that, Brendan, I want to also add Shia Mala's question. What a nice name who asked about basically saying governments are constantly talking about how mitigation is going to hurt the national economy, but surely not focusing on health is also going to hurt the national economy. So um, where's the where's the evidence saying that, um, you know, how can we make the, the case, I suppose, that governments need to mitigate climate change in relation to health in order to boost economic well-being and productivity? You see that question there? I don't know if I've done it justice. Is there yeah, research mean, I, giving I, governments options? Yeah. Well, I think it was asking for options for mitigation. Yes. And, and yes, and the answer to that is yes. And from a global perspective, that's what the Working Group 3 report did. It looked at the mitigation options, which we haven't talked about. And of course, that's what the current um, Albanese government is. I mean, their policy was based on a particular mitigation pathway electrification and decarbonisation pathway. So, I mean, those, but, but I think maybe the question, you know, the, the question is getting to the economic benefits of healthy people. Um, and, you know, there has been an awful lot of work done on the health benefits of, of mitigating climate change and, and of adaptation. And the now deceased Tony McMichael um, led, led the way in that. Um, with Lancet and, I, and IPCC. So that, you know, there's, in terms of the economic case, um, maybe Shannon might want to say something about that. I'll just add to what Brennan said. Yes, there is increasing amount of economic evidence. Um, we're looking at looking at ambulance call outs and um, the, the cost of those in our project. Um, it's, I guess it's really about using that evidence and continuing to advocate those trade-offs between um, parts of the system, as Tony said. So how that cost shifting occurs and, and how we at least identify what the potential benefits are um, and, and what other parts of the system could be doing. And I think it comes back to the heart of that governance question though, in order to take more coordinated action. Um, if I could just jump in for one second as well, like there's a long history here in, in urban redesign as a response to public health initiatives or public health crisis, let's say. I mean, even going back to the Industrial Revolution, and Brendan was talking about that as the sort of the, the start point of the, of the current climate change uh, uh, problem. Like one of the big problems in the Industrial Revolution over time is people kept dying in cities because they were so filthy and polluted and disgusting. And uh, that was bad for industrialists because they were losing workforce faster than they could replace them sometimes. And, and that led to um, like a significant increase in public health awareness across Europe where things like waterborne illness were, were, were figured out for the first time and where emergency exit routes were put into buildings and fire escapes were used and emergency services were established. And over time, the idea that people should live in the, the, the shadow of big factories just became deeply unfashionable and, and, and self-evidently so. And, and so different types of, of zoning was looked at and different types of, of, of organizing spaces looked at. And we have and, and we saw it again sort of in, in part with the response to COVID is like it is possible to reorganize cities and space in response to public health uh, crisis and we regularly do it. And so I suspect for heat we're going to see a lot more of that into the into the future. And it's, we have plenty of historical analogy or analogs here. It's not the first time we've, we've been to this rodeo. You know? Definitely not. That's a really good point. And you know we were able to reorganize society pretty quickly for COVID. Um, I, I do often think to myself, what if more than one thing happens at once? So what, I, what I've learned from working with emergency or humanitarian organisations for a long time is we're very bad at doing more than one thing at a time. So if there was a pandemic and a bushfire, we might struggle or, you know, we don't we wouldn't have 
evacuation centres that would cope with also maintaining pandemic standards and you know all those types of things. So um, there's a there's a comment in the chat from Kazi Rahman who makes that point. So thinking about a, 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 a Kazi makes a point, but it would be useful to see the role of heat like bushfires. So when bushfires happen, we focus on safety from fire inju injuries and then on air pollution. We might often ignore heat related illnesses especially when the fires are burning for a long time, resulting in long standing air pollution and people need to stay indoors. I think that's quite right. I'm still hearing of um, people in Canberra and other parts of the South Coast who are having, uh, you know, real respiratory issues from the long term air pollution. Are there long term impacts from exposure to extreme heat, Shannon, that people need to think about? Or, or more kind of a, a more three dimensional idea of what extreme heat does to the body. Uh, I can't really help you with that one, Susan. I don't, I'm not really exactly sure. I mean, most of the work is around the acute heat related illness, um, but it, obviously if you're exacerbating underlying conditions then that possibly could um, contribute to those conditions worsening, um, which might lead into a disability, more of a disability kind of condition. So um, I don't know if there's been any, a lot of research about the long term consequences. I guess we've never had to know that, have we? It's a bit going to be a bit like long COVID maybe. Um, well, yeah, I, I think Susan, sorry to, if I can jump in, I guess there is a limit to the, par to the analogy with COVID because COVID Actually, we, we're still in the middle of the pandemic. If you look at the data last week, we had 30,000 um, reported infections of COVID in Australia and 109 deaths from COVID. So uh, it's kind of in, I mean, it, it, it's interesting that we, we our, our governments are telling us the pandemic's over when those statistics are still like they are. But, you know, COVID eventually will come and go like all pandemics. The thing about climate change heat waves is as I said we've got another 0.4 degree locked in yeah. and so we know they're going to get worse and also there's the lag in the system so there's going to be further increases even if we what's now looking miraculously like we stabilize at 1.5 so we've got these shifting risk kind of heat risk profiles for some you know another one to two decades is the best scenario so it's not like a pandemic that comes and goes, you know. Um, we have to think of, I mean, I think it's a really good question. What kind of public health, what kind of policies or changes in public health orders are we going to be looking at? Absolutely. Um, can I just check, sorry, can I just check with Natasha? I've got the scheduled um, time finishing at 2 p.m. Is that correct or would we like to? Um, close a little bit earlier. If we could wrap up by 1.45, I think that would be good, Sue. Okay, excellent. Um, well, we've just got a few more questions. Just I want to just, uh, some of them are comments and they're very excellent comments. There's, uh, there's a discussion around um, how poor people should deal with energy poverty. And uh, Brendan's answered that question around clean energy solutions. Uh, I would point out uh, there is a really significant issue for people who rent and people who are, are struggling with that um, negotiation with landlords to retrofit housing that might not be fit for purpose in the upcoming environment. I just thought, Tony, I know you've worked on that. How do we how do we kind of solve those types of inequities? Um, probably through government incentives because the big issue is that and this applies to the commercial sector as well the owners of the buildings are not the people that are living there or working there or occupying them a lot of the time and so they're um the incentive that they have or the drive that they have within themselves to remediate the internal environment's not there because they're not experiencing it um and so they're less inclined to pay to fix it then because it's not their problem uh, and so if you want landlords for example to put solar panels on rental houses so that tenants won't be financially um, majorly disadvantaged by running the aircon, then probably the only way to get them to do that is through a series of government incentives because there's no other market incentive that I'm aware of that's going to deliver. Mm. I have heard an interesting trial happening with community batteries 
as well, which I think is really interesting. You know, the government making an investment in community batteries in some of those areas. But yeah, it's it's and and renovations to houses, they also will need to be heavily incentivized, I think. But there is a is a clear regulatory role here, isn't there? I mean, we just shouldn't have built housing like that if it's probably not fit for purpose even now, let alone 10 years into the future. I, um, in, in the environmental design standards and regulations of Australian housing generally um, are very poor. And actually, I would say that on average, we've probably gone backwards because if you look at some of the older housing stock like Queenslanders and things like that, they were way more climate conscious than anything we've been building at scale recently. That's a good point. Uh, also in the chat, we've had a discussion about the decrease of deaths from cold, which is a good point, although there are some cold extremes that occur from climate change, my understanding, as well as, as things change. But that's a, a point that's covered in the IPCC report that Brendan points out. There was a great point from Ruby about, is there an opportunity for sporting clubs to educate the community on understanding and management of heat waves, which is a great idea. Um, Kazi points out that they, they need to build modular houses in the Northern Rivers after the floods. And we've talked about buyback issues. Um, housing that is mobile uh, and, and the mobility of housing, it was a, a very large discussion in the United States when I was there. But also the fact that pretty much every caravan park in Australia is built on the most vulnerable land to all kinds of things, flooding and all sorts of coastal issues. Um, so, you know, a lot of people in insecure housing live in those parks. Um, Angela makes the point that Susan, we have so sorry. much land and we're building tiny houses. Yes, yeah, sorry, Brennan. Sorry, just, you're just on the heat coal thing, just to, I mean, there's a whole, that's dealt with in chapter seven, which is the health chapter in in working group two. But yeah, obviously, as 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 the planet heats, the um, cold in the general trend is that you get fewer cold deaths and more heat deaths, and there's a ratio of the two. So that's the index that's tracked. But you know, it's it's um, in recent years, it's clearly shifted to be to be to be worse. You know, the number of deaths is more. The mortality from heat waves is outweighing the the reduction in deaths from extreme cold. Um, but but he's quite right. The, the person's quite right. You've got to take those into account. And the ratio of the two is the index they use to track that difference. Thank you. It's really interesting. Um, and uh, there's a final question in there, which I'll, I'll let you from Fahad Brennan, that I'll let you have a look at about climate finance. So at COP, COP27 in Egypt, there's big, finally starting to get some pledges from countries, Germany and others, um, around uh, basically the Green Climate Fund and dealing with loss and damage. But we know that the, the finance to the Pakistan floods has been dismal, um, absolutely dismal. And we're going to just have more and more of these types of major emergencies and the UN, the UN emergency funds were already not coping with what there was. So, yeah, yeah, so, um, the, yeah. Yeah, so, so for the Paris at the Paris Agreement in what, 2015, the governments agreed, the developed governments agreed to set up a, a climate fund, climate finance fund, and, and they pledged that they would provide $100 billion a year every year. To help developing countries mitigate, you know, leapfrog um, fossil fuel energy sources to clean energy sources and adapt to climate change impacts. That's $100 billion every year. And in the last seven years, I think there's a total of 10 billion in that fund, right? So it hasn't shifted. And, and in addition to that, now at this COP, which is happening as we speak, uh, a kind of parallel related topic of loss and damages on, which is who's going to, it's, it's, it's reparations, who's going to compensate us, being a developing country, for the losses and damage to our human natural systems and the deaths from the climate change that you wealthy countries have, have, have caused, you know, because of what you've done over the last 170 years. So uh, it, it's a huge issue. I was pleased to hear our um, uh, Minister Bowen on AM this morning saying that Australia supported loss and damage being on the agenda and that 
So they've started the conversation about a loss and damage fund, but you know, they're still about, you know, a hundred, hundred, well, tens of hundreds of billion, billions of dollars behind in the climate finance fund. And a recent pr projection I showed that said that by you know 2030, 2040, they would need they would need a trillion a year in that fund, not a hundred billion, you know, a thousand hundred billion. So, you know, where the the cost of not mitigating greenhouse gas emissions is just growing and growing, and it's a huge additional burden on developing countries who are very angry about it. Um, which is, I guess, probably what Jane's experiencing. So I'll uh, come to you next, Jane. Um, we're going to have final comments now. We'll, we'll try. We've, set, we've laid down some pretty depressing stuff in this conversation. And thank you so much for all your brilliant questions, everyone. I'm going to come to the panel in a second to ask them what makes you hopeful in this space. Um, and uh, we've got a few things that if people are interested in this discussion, they can sign up and get involved in. So Tony and Shannon are both involved in a heat and health community of practice, which is for professionals in that space. Um, you can sign up uh, through the CAB website to find out more details about that. Next year, we're going to be having a showcase event for the Climate Action Beacon, and we'll, we'd love to invite everybody on this event to participate in that. Um, you can participate in research that Shannon is running if you're a person over a particular age, and we can get you to uh, mention what that is. You can um, participate in groundbreaking research around heat health. Um, and soon I'm going to be launching the Climate Justice Observatory, which helps you. It's going to help Queenslanders model extreme heat in their neighbourhood so that they can kind of have a bit more control over understanding what will happen in terms of frequency and duration over time in their own neighbourhood and lots and lots of resources to help understand what that will what that means for those who are more vulnerable in the community and how we can all help each other get through it because Brendan is right and that's what makes me hopeful there is a million things we can do to make this a more just transition and to look after each other and we definitely have that capacity so Jean first what makes you hopeful in this space give us the final word uh, I suppose what makes me hopeful is that we are managing to uh, reduce emissions of well, in, reduce the rate of increase of emissions of greenhouse gases such that the warming that we thought would occur very likely uh, 10 years or 15 years ago now looks as though it cannot eventuate. So whereas we used to talk about RCP 8.5, uh, which meant that we were on a, a very high rate of warming, now is not going to happen. I think that's absolutely certain. We definitely dropped to a lower level and uh, Brendan pointed out uh, 7.0 now would be a, an appropriate uh, pathway and maybe that will drop again. So hopefully the warming that we thought would occur is not going to occur. So hopefully things are not going to be quite as bad as we thought they were going to be. I think Tony's pointed out as a lot of things that we can do here in Australia. Uh, the population is uh, well educated. It's well off. Um, there are many strategies that we can adopt and it's likely that we will do so from the perspective of Australia. I think we're in a pretty good place to cope with what's going to happen. Uh, but we do need, as, as has been pointed out, through loss and damage mechanisms to help people living in less fortunate circumstances in low and middle income countries. Thank you. Shannon? Um, I, I, what makes me hopeful is that we're actually having these discussions and I don't think we've really talked about the heat challenge enough. And I think um, from my discussions with government and industry um, that, and other researchers that this really is becoming a lot more, um, there's an increased awareness. I think there's an awareness in terms of the professional awareness. I'm not sure there's a commensurate awareness in the community that heat is a real issue and that there are things that we can be doing to mitigate the potential health risks from it. So I'm hopeful that we're having these discussions and um, I'm hopeful that out of the work that's happening across 
the country and also the awareness raising through, unfortunately, the big events that we've seen in the Northern Hemisphere, um, that we'll start to see some shifts in, in policy. Um, I live in hope, I guess. We have to. So we just have to keep 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 that positive mindset. Tony. Oh, um, well, look, we've I mean, just look in this one space, this heat and health and and responding to heat, even in the last five years, we've we've, we've had a massive journey. Um, so I guess I've always been on the climate change adaptation side of things. It's not that I'm not interested in the mitigation. It's just that I only have so much time to go around and, and, and so much research potential to go around. And, and so I've always kind of, like I said earlier, looked at uh, impact and, and where the impacts are landing and, and who they're hitting the hardest and who they're going to hit the hardest and what can be done about it. And and within the heat space and heat within cities, um, which I think is a, not an exclusively an Australian problem, but it's a big problem here in Australia. I think there's been a huge increase in recognition of that as a problem and recognition of that as a space where we can have meaningful solutions. And you can even disassociate the entire heat argument from climate change and still have a really powerful series of of rationales for going forward and the potential to have great multiple benefits in return. Most of the heat auditing that I do these days is integrated with environmental design auditing, uh, universal access auditing, crime prevention through environmental design auditing. You know, we're, like we're not just looking at heat, we're looking at like spatial improvement. Heat might be the reason, but there's many other. So in that regard, I think, you know, we've got a lot to be optimistic about. And look, I, I landed up here 12 years ago when, when it was the millennium drought was coming to an end and, and that was something that Eventually, you know, we got on top of as well, and now we've had ten or twelve years of rain to deal with, and got on top of that too, and you know, as best we can. And it's sort of we 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 I think there's great potential in terms of dealing with the challenges that are in front of us, not just today, but also into the into the medium term. And I suspect over time we'll get better at the long term too. So I'm fairly optimistic on the heat thing. It's not pretty, but I think we're doing well. Thank you so much. It's good to hear, uh, Brendan. Oh, well, I'm optimistic. You know, mainly because I'm cycle. You know, I'm. For some reason, I was born psychologically optimistic, so <laughs> I consider myself operationally optimistic. I love that. <laughs> I think if you're going to be a climate scientist, that's a very good way to be, right? <laughs> um, it also helps if you want to be a human rights lawyer. Uh, so oh. I, I, I maintain a sense of radical hope, but at the moment I'm hopeful because all these wonderful people chose to join us today to have this conversation and these wonderful researchers are dedicating their talent and time and effort to this amazingly difficult issue. So that but makes me I, hopeful sorry, and grateful. I, what I haven't quite finished. So what I what I, <laughs> what I wanted to add was I, you know, I, I think what's hopeful about this is, as we said, it's not just the hazard, it's it's the circumstances people find themselves in and 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 you know, so in dealing with the increase in heat related impacts on people from climate change, we can do a lot of social good, an enormous amount of good, you know, in terms of our urban design and housing and how we care for people. So a lot of good can come out of this if we do it wrong. Absolutely. A beautiful way to end this seminar. Uh, would you join me in thanking our speakers and uh, thanks to everyone who joined us today. We're very grateful for your time and please get in touch.